so today we'll have a conversation with Dr. Gip about some interesting topics of, about uh, Teranostics. But before we go there, I'd like to set the stage with very few slides just to recap some basics and some mega trends that we see in Teranostics. So this is a classic image from 2018. As most of you know, Teranostics is a therapy for cancer that uses molecular imaging in our context to identify and confirm the presence of a biological target. And then we use particle radiation tagged to a molecule targeting the same target that we identified with the image. So this image here shows multiple patients treated with lutetium PSMA. It's, those are the super responders. So it's a miracle drug for those who respond. But this field has incredible potential because this knowledge is evolving fast. And at the same time, there's a lot of discovery and a lot of change coming into this field. So we as industry, developing solutions for diagnostics, we have to be very mindful, as we've been, to the trends that is driving this discipline forward. I'd like to talk about that. So before we start with Dr. Gip, the three mega trends in diagnostics. Many fields are evolving, but we are evolving really fast, a rapid expansion. The second one is a rapid pace of innovation. Also, common theme in healthcare, but in our particular field, extremely fast. And the increasing role of AI, which is also a common theme across healthcare, but for us, particularly fast and important. So to illustrate the first point, rapid expansion, that means more patients being eligible for the diagnostic procedure. So this picture is one and only illustration about that. Two years ago, in the United States, 7% of the centers that do PET scans were doing PSMA PET for prostate cancer. Today, roughly 70% are offering this study. So you can see how fast, uh, unprecedented in PET imaging, how fast this is evolving. So that means there will be workflow challenges, especially in the busy centers, to handle all this volume of patients. Similar, but a different trend, is the rapid pace of innovation, new discoveries, new applications. So there are more than 20 new drugs, uh, well-funded by startups or pharma companies. In there are hundreds of trials and actually hundreds of drugs in preclinical, clinical stage phase one, but in advanced stage, more than 20 at least. So there will be new indications. Today, high volume, we only see prostate, neuroendocrine tumors, but we see multiple cancers being tested, and most likely, many of those new drugs will be successful, which means more medical specialties will be involved, more ways to select patients, more ways to follow the therapy, more ways to make decisions, more ways to report cases, and more complexity in general. So this leads to the third trend, artificial intelligence. We believe artificial intelligence will play a major role. The moment we have more than one approach, for example, to treat prostate cancer, using different particles, alpha <laughs> particles versus beta particles, mm -hmm. different types of drugs based on antibodies or based on peptides, different combination of therapies. There will be multiple decisions and multiple ways to predict and multiple ways to use artificial intelligence. We believe artificial intelligence is going to be a third pillar in diagnostics. Besides the imaging, the target, and treating it, there will be an intelligent algorithm in between. So with this, I have a busy slide showing the GE Healthcare solutions for diagnostics. It's a large portfolio. We intersect with the diagnostics value chain in 10 points. On the more scientific or radionuclide production side, we have cyclotrons, radiochemistry mm -hmm. solutions, and molecular imaging agents. The common theme is high productivity and the flexibility to do clinical and research work. On the imaging and advanced visualization side, we offer PET scanners, SPEC scanners, MIM software, which we just acquired, and we have a large team of artificial intelligence experts. The common theme here is ultra high resolution, ultra high sensitivity, and ultra high quantitation accuracy. We'll talk about that with Dr. Gibb in a minute. And finally, 
in critical services to make diagnostics possible, we have clinical and workflow solutions as well as scientific, uh, strategic advisory services or consulting services to enable diagnostics clinics to succeed. This is arguably the most extensive portfolio in diagnostics in the industry, and everything that we do aims at delivering speed, accuracy, adaptability to cope with those trends that we just talked about. The rapid expansion, the rapid innovation, and the increasing role of artificial intelligence. So now let's turn to the expert. Dr. Gibb, first question for you. So you see that uh, in our scanners, we have a high focus on resolution and ultra high sensitivity. Do you agree that this is relevant for diagnostics and why? Thank you, Sergio. You made it very easy for me to answer this first one. I think in so many ways, greater resolution, greater sensitivity is something what we expect every time we do any kind of imaging. But especially if we're speaking about cancer care, let me start from the fact that there is a patient on the other end of the line. I like to think about sensitivity, especially with the nuclear medicine applications, as the way to also shorten the time that the patient is in the scanner. We have treated the patient. We need to make sure that we acquire information about how is the pharmaceutical distributed in the body so that we can predict the outcomes earlier than later. So let's say with StarGuide, we can do the scan in 10 minutes. And I think that this is something so important for the patients that are not necessarily feeling well. I think that's just one aspect of this. Then we also speak about the throughput. Efficiency is one of the biggest concerns in healthcare today. Well, if we can scan faster, if we can scan faster but not really give up on the resolution, not give up on the clinical relevancy of the skin, I think that also is a great thing. Therefore, higher sensitivity, high resolution is always important. Now, another factor is opening doors for new applications. Let's say if I go back to the PET imaging at the diagnostic or the theranostic application, making an assumption on what kind of the treatment is going to be the best for the patient, well, today we're not necessarily using zirconium or copper, those lower activity isotopes or imaging tracers that broadly. I think if we have a chance to move this higher sensitivity scanners into clinical practice, this will open doors and help us to also translate this research into practical applications. And being a physician, clinically, you mentioned neuroendocrine tumors. Think about this. We can combine and make a multi-tracer studies, potentially using not only FDG but data date in the same patient which would mean that one of the tracers have to come at a much lower activity at a much lower doses. Well, how can you do this if you do not have the scanner that enables the greatest possible sensitivity and resolution? I hope I answered your question. You did so. So, uh, and, and let's correlate that also with this fascinating topic of AI in the context of diagnostics. First, first of all, do you believe that AI will play a role? And how would you connect that with the way we've been doing uh, our development and our engineering of our systems. Especially in the field of theranostics, I don't think that AI is just a buzzword. I really think it's a great need, kind of making this connection to what we have just discussed. Greater resolution, smaller lesions, naturally increases the amount of data that we collect. If I also look a little bit into the future, we're talking about applications where we can predictively build prognostic models about how the therapy is gonna be affecting the patients. Maybe today we're only focusing on later stages of cancer, but we definitely want to make sure that radiotheranostics also coming to broader range of stages, more applications, greater number of molecules, more isotopes, that all together again, translates into greater number of data. And if I know one thing about AI and computers, computers are so much better at handling data. 
therefore I think it's an open door for AI to come into the field where we can reduce the burden of cancer through the application of radiopharmaceutical therapy. Now, if I can just add one last thing to this. When we speak about greater scanners, higher sensitivity, AI models are only as good as the data that is used to train them. That's why building a great scanners is not just about the imaging itself, but it's also about providing our customers data that can be used for building better algorithms on deep learning and AI itself. Yeah, and uh, the, the moment that we believe that AI is going to play a role, everything that we've been doing gets a new and a fresh and, and a much higher value. There's much more value in fixing the motion of the images, so you increase quantitation accuracy, reconstructing it the right way, using machine learning to assist in the reconstruction process, and, and I'm showing some, some information on screen here. Oh, you do? And how much, how much progress we have made over the last decade in terms of reconstruction and quantitation accuracy. So that's extremely important to make the data reliable for the algorithms to perform. Cannot agree more. Yeah. So, the algorithms that we will develop, they need to be hosted by a flexible platform. So we just welcome MIM to our family. Yes, we did. And this whole context of developing artificial intelligence and so on, what's the relevance of having a platform that is like MIM? That's a great question because we are at the Radiation Oncology Show, but MIM software is so much better than just quantering, delineation, data storage for radiation oncology. MIM is an extremely strong player and has a fantastic footprint in nuclear medicine dealing with reporting, quantification, reporting of the findings. And if we look also potentially at the greater personalization of any therapy, including radiopharmaceutical therapy, this is also about providing means to perform perhaps dosimetry in further personalization uh, based on the findings that we can report during the scan itself. So therefore, not only that we welcome MIM into our team, not only that we embrace the portfolio of the solutions that they build, towards nuclear medicine, but it's also about sending the signal to our users and to the market that this is an area for growth. Theranostics is something where we do expect the area that will experience greater growth, and therefore we're getting ready by ramping up the solutions that will help to get greater relevance out of the studies that are available today and will become available in the future. Thank you. And, uh... One last question that will go along with this, this whole uh, discussion. Certainly. So we have the accuracy, and we are developing artificial intelligence algorithms, and we have a platform that is adaptable and fast evolving and can post. But none of this is possible if we don't have the right partners. Mm -hmm. So partnerships, common theme in healthcare, and it's been there for a long time. We have many partners. We have many partners over time. But what's the relevance of partnerships for Theranostics specifically in light of what we discussed? I love this discussion. I also think that it's not just about partnerships for the sake of partnerships, but it's the complexity that we are starting to deal with that ma makes it very obvious that nobody can do this just on their own. I think it's very important to see the strengths and the weaknesses and then try to come up with something where we can combine the efforts to really advance the field. I do believe that Theranostics radiopharmaceutical therapy is experiencing the start of its growth, and therefore it is also turning away from just being nice to have into something that I believe everybody should start thinking as a must have. Also, so nice to see that patients start to demand those kind of the treatments that will further advance the growth for the field. Therefore, I think partnerships is one of the key area and a great few examples that we have just discussed, in my view, is just a starting point. Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's been a great focus for us as well. In addition to a large portfolio, a comprehensive portfolio, 
that is focused on the right trends, in our view, of diagnostics. For sure. Creating long-term partnerships is also a major focus. So I guess uh, we covered our topics and I would like to invite questions from uh, the audience if you would like to. Perhaps if there are questions or you can always come and see us on the booth after we're done or anytime before the end of the day. Uh, please come and see us. We're happy to have a discussion and answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibb.